our Father, who art in heaven. If you thought exorcisms in movies were scary, you'll be surprised to know that some of them are actually inspired by reality. In this video, we're taking a look at the real-life exorcism of Emily Rose. When most people think of an exorcism, they conjure up images from various films of someone tied to a bed as their bodies contort and they scream and growl at the top of their lungs while a priest sprays holy water onto them. Out of all the films, The Exorcism of Emily Rose is by far one of the most popular horror movies of all time, telling the story of Reverend Moore, who sets out to perform an exorcism on a girl who he believes is possessed by demons. And while the priest has been charged with the negligent homicide of the girl under the guise of exorcising her, he has his own story to tell about the whole event. Now, as interesting as the movie is, it's barely anything compared to the real-life experiences of a German woman named Annalise Michel, the girl who served as the inspiration behind this cult classic horror flick. Annalise Michel was born in Germany in September 1952. The Michels were a hard-working and conservative Roman Catholic family who lived in Klingenberg, not far from the sawmill owned and operated by Annalise's father, Joseph. Annalise's older sister died at the age of eight from complications following a kidney removal surgery, leaving Annalise as the oldest of four daughters. Her mother, Anna, spent the majority of her time working in the sawmill business with Joseph, so the children were often looked after by Annalise's religious grandmother. The family attended Mass every Sunday and occasionally on weekday evenings, and they frequently recited the rosary together. As a result, it's safe to say that the Michels were a deeply religious family. Early in her childhood, Annalise began to develop some health problems. She contracted mumps, measles, and scarlet fever all before the age of five, but she was otherwise a good student who was well-liked by her teachers and her mother hoped she would become a teacher herself. But as time passed by, Annalise's condition started getting worse. In September 1968, around the time of her 16th birthday, while sitting close to her friend, Annalise briefly lost consciousness. She dismissed the incident as being overly tired, but later that night, she woke up and found that she couldn't move or talk for a few moments. As Annalise regained her senses, she realized that she had wet the bed. Terrified by the whole situation, the girl changed her sheets and went to talk to her mother. They both came to the conclusion that it was just an accident and decided not to make a big deal out of it. Time went on and nothing too out of the ordinary happened with Annalise until almost a year later in August of 1969. The same incident happened again with Annalise experiencing another brief blackout during the day and a paralysis episode in the night. She told their mother again, and this time they finally went to see the family doctor who referred them to a neurologist named Dr. Luthi. The doctor asked them a lot of questions and performed extensive tests, but everything came back normal, leading the doctor to conclude that it was most likely a case of cerebral seizures with signs of grand mal epilepsy. Because the seizures were so far apart, Annalise wasn't given any anti-convulsion medication. Soon she returned to school. However, her condition got worse after having her tonsils removed and contracting pleurisy and pneumonia. In January 1970, she was sent to a hospital, then the following month to a clinic that specialized in bronchial and lung disease in young people. Throughout the process, Annalise became more devoted to her Catholic faith. She started considering becoming a catechist rather than a school teacher. In June 1970, while still at the clinic, Annalise had another seizure. Two weeks later, she saw another neurologist. The test revealed no abnormalities, but the doctor prescribed an anticonvulsion. Annalise eventually left the clinic and returned home at the end of August, but her personality had changed greatly by then. It's unclear exactly when Annalise started experiencing visions, but during her stay at the clinic, she began to see what she later described as ghastly demonic faces she would also experience periods in which she smelled a horrible stench similar to burning fecal. And soon, she would randomly start shaking and claiming that she was seeing demons. These incidents haunted Annalise, gradually changing her personality, leaving her depressed and withdrawn, and she was hesitant to return to school. Her grades dropped, and she continued to experience brief periods of unconsciousness and body stiffness, as well as another seizure in June 1972, prompting another visit to Dr. Luthi. More tests were performed, but the results were inconclusive, so they recommended her a different anticonvulsion medication, hoping for a better result. But the unconsciousness and body stiffness became even more frequent later in the year. 
And while no further seizures happened by June 1973, Annalise continued to experience demonic faces and foul odors, eventually driving her to tell her parents about them as well as saying she heard voices telling her she would be damned to hell forever. By this time, her depression had worsened and she told a psychiatrist that she felt like she was in a deep pit during this time with frequent suicidal thoughts. The medication prescribed to Annalise in previous years did not appear to be working, but Annalise grew up in an extremely religious Catholic family, instead treating this as a mental disorder they all believed that the young girl had been taken over by demons. So they took her to the Catholic church for an exorcism. Before entering the church, something really unusual happened. Her mother claimed to have seen Annalise standing before their statue of the Virgin Mary one day, her face filled with hatred and her eyes jet black. Mind you, this is the same girl that wanted to be a catechist. The incident at Virgin Mary's shrine confirmed that the family suspicion that Annalise was, in fact, possessed. Everyone's suspicions only grew stronger when Annalise claimed she was unable to enter the church. She swore that the ground burnt like fire. Her parents managed to drag her inside, but things only got worse from there. Annalise couldn't even bear to look at holy pictures or sacramentals. When the priest handed her holy water to drink, she refused it and claimed it smelled bad. Following this, a family friend advised contacting a priest who specialized in cases like this. The family agreed and went to see him. Surprisingly, the priest found Annalise to be perfectly normal, but a little shy. With no indication of possession, he suggested that she see a specialist. Unsatisfied by this answer, the family kept taking the girl to different priests. One suggested that she see a neurologist. Another told them that there was nothing he could do. The family was feeling hopeless, but then one of the priests who had sat in on some of the meetings with the first priest ended up discussing Annalise's situation with a friend of his, Father Ernst Alt. When Father Alt first heard about Annalise, he claims he was suddenly able to describe the entire Michelle's family and could feel enormous radiation emanating straight from Annalise's head to his. Two days later, at night during mass, the father was struck with a force to his back and smelled an intense stench as though something was burning, claiming that a negative force was surrounding him. These claims were later described in court by a psychiatrist as pseudo-hallucinations, possibly suggesting that Father Alt suffered from schizophrenia. Alt became further interested in the case, and several weeks later, he finally met with Annalise. Alt would visit her at university nearly every two weeks, but she still suffered from depression and experienced visions of demonic faces. About six years later, when Annalise turned 22, the signs started showing like never before. According to her friends and family, she would always be in a weird trance-like state when she was always blanking out, not being able to comprehend what was going on around her. She continued to take the medication that her doctors had put her on for her supposed epilepsy, but they just didn't seem to work because every day she would wake up in the same state. She said that she would hear voices telling her to rot in hell, which is when the girl started insisting that she was possessed by demons. She had sought out tons of priests who could perform exorcisms on her in the past, but they all rejected her request, saying that she should seek medical help or the bishop's permission to be exorcised. By September of 1974, Father Alt had grown increasingly convinced that Annalise was suffering from demonic possessions. He wrote a letter to his superior, Bishop Joseph, requesting permission to perform an exorcism on Annalise in secret to avoid any religious sanctions. The request was denied, and Alt was told to be patient. Now, whether Annalise was fully delusional at this point or whether she was possessed, her condition just started to deteriorate. She would rip off her clothes in public, bark like an animal for hours, and even eat insects. Throughout 1975, her condition became worse. She began to lose her appetite and occasionally stayed in bed for several days at a time, and eventually considered dropping out of the university entirely. By June of that year, she completely lost control of herself. Annalise would suddenly start throwing things at her friends and acting strangely. She became convinced that she was condemned to hell based on the voices she heard. When Father Alt came to visit and pray with her, she ripped the rosary to pieces. Alt became convinced of her possession and told Annalise's family to come pick her up. Annalise's friends told Alt that occasionally she would tell them to stop praying because it hurt her. She removed a picture from Jesus from her wall and she no longer went to church complaining that she couldn't enter the building. They also described how sometimes at home her legs would stiffen and she would be unable to walk properly. One day, while on a walk with her friend, Annalise dropped to her knees and was unresponsive for 10 minutes afterwards. She suddenly leaped up and exclaimed that she was free and she saw the Virgin Mary. Two months later, at a visit to a monastery, she claims to have seen the Virgin Mary again, who told her that so many young souls in Germany are lost and Annalise could do penance for those souls to help save them. 
She discussed it with her parents. They were gravely concerned and told her that she couldn't go through with this, but Annalise told them that she has to accept it because if she doesn't, souls may be lost. She agreed to the deal and told her parents that after a couple of weeks, she would finally be free. That never ended up happening, and her condition got bad again when she returned to the university. Her friends grew afraid and took her back home. Father Alt again contacted the bishop for permission to carry out an exorcism. And after hearing all of this, how could he say no? The Bishop of Wurzburg granted the father permission to perform exorcisms on the young girl twice a week. But the only catch was that these exorcisms were supposed to be completely private to protect Annalise. With these exorcism sessions, Annalise mentioned that she was possessed by the demons of Lucifer, Cain, Judas Iscariot, Adolf Hitler, Nero, and Fleischmann, a disgraced priest. She also said that the six of them fought inside her head all day, fighting for the power in her body, completely draining it from her. And while she did improve for a while with the sessions, her condition once again started to go downhill, and for some reason, she could never recover after that. At the age of just 23, Annalise Michelle died of starvation and dehydration on July 1st, 1976, because she had just refused to eat or drink anything. As a result of her untimely death, Annalise's parents and pastor were charged with negligent homicide. But this was a time when there was already a lot of fear surrounding demonic possessions with the release of movies like The Exorcist, creating a wave of paranoia within the people. This is why it wasn't until two years later when Michelle's case could officially come to court, where the attorneys played more than 40 hours worth of recordings of the exorcism session to prove that the girl really had been taken over by demons. This unfortunate case came to light with the 2005 movie, The Exorcism of Emily Rose, and that's when Annalise's story took over the world. The young girl's two priests were found guilty of manslaughter, with her parents being let off because they had already suffered enough. But whether the story of Annalise Michelle was one of spirituality or science, no one still holds the answer to this question. That's a wrap for the real-life exorcism of Emily Rose. What do you think of this creepy story? See you next time with something new, and until then, goodbye.